Hello and welcome back or welcome to the channel. I'm Loudguns and I decided that since it's a new year I wanted to kick off with a video I've been mulling over for a while. Try and decipher all of the potential professions that players can look forward to in the future of Star Citizen and how they could synergize to create a living breathing economy on an MMORPG scale. This is obviously going to include a fair bit of theory crafting but wherever possible I'm going to try and incorporate bits from the developers to ground it all. This idea of collaboration and competition in a sci-fi world was what got me excited about Star Citizen in the first place, and I hope this video gets you thinking about what you might be looking to do in the game long term. In a vid this long, I might get a few things wrong, but when I was back at university writing essays at unsavoury hours of the morning, a running joke was that you didn't really need to proofread your work. You could just post it as a YouTube video and someone would correct you down in the comments. So if all this sounds good to you, then grab a cup of tea while I roll the intro, and then let's get into it. Just for a bit of context on this one, in 3.18 we're going to see the first iteration of crafting, and while it's in an incredibly limited form, it has seriously got my attention. Before I started playing SC, I was a hardcore survival game junkie, with more hours than I care to admit in games like Ark, Atlas, Last Oasis and Space Engineers, so this kind of thing is my jam. I'm looking far ahead of the first iteration of crafting though. CRG have commented that this addition of crafting functionality to the filler stations on salvage ships allowing players to make themselves a multi-tool and attractor beam attachment out of one SCU of RMC, is just the stopgap solution. And can I just take a minute to point out that this is one incredibly expensive tractor beam at approximately 15,000 credits. Clearly this is just a convenience thing for when you leave port and farm your first couple of SCU in your vulture, and then realise you left your pyro multi-tool at the station. However, a more advanced crafting system, used by both players and NPCs, will be essential to understanding how the economy of the verse all comes together and therefore how we can define a variety of professions. So when we're talking about crafting, I think the best place to begin is with recipes. I had to go back to July 2017 to find this snippet on recipes from an episode of Around the Verse, but it's really helped shape some of my thinking on this subject. Pete Mackey explained his role in developing SC's economy by working out recipes for items so that the team could build out supply chains and an idea of how manufacturing might work making the items that a location buys aligned with the things that it then produces. If we take Riari Amvik Research Outpost as an example, looking at SC trade tools I can see a breakdown of what they're buying and selling, and we can draw the assumption that the things they want to buy are either, like the processed food, used to keep the facility operational, or are used in the manufacturing of the end goods that they then sell to traders for onward distribution. Commodities such as halogens, astatine, chlorine, iodine and fluorine, natural harvestables such as amyoshi plague, and even vice-like distilled spirits could form the recipes for end products like medical supplies. Although, let's face it, if they're stuck down on Calliope in a small outpost like Rayari Amvik, maybe those scientists are just partying it up on the distilled spirits. It's impossible to know how much of the manufacturing process players are going to be able to control, but there have been definite hints that we'll be able to get stuck in. It just might not be on the same scale as say EVE Online where players manufacture everything from base components up to massive battleships and titans. Given SC's business model, I'm not sure that CIG are going to give us the keys to a ship factory. I think there's a fair chance we could acquire recipes spanning from the basic end of things all the way up to things like advanced ship components and weapons. So since we have this idea of recipes, we know that the devs have a list of unique commodities that they use to create items in the verse. And thanks to the guys over at the SC Wiki who were able to pull this entire list out of the game files. Commodities can be split into two broad categories of natural commodities and man-made commodities, then subcategorized further. The natural commodities include things like gases such as helium and hydrogen, halogens like astatine, metals like aluminium, minerals like bexalite, harvestables like your Amiyoshi Plague, non-metals such as borace, and waste items such as rock. Meanwhile, man-made commodities include the subcategories alloys such as Atlassium, a strong alloy salvageable from severe wrecks, 
Agricultural supplies like unprocessed crops. Consumer goods like the AV equipment that made a lot of people mega rich during Invictus. Food like the processed food blocks those Rayari Amvic folks have to get pretty drunk to endure. Medical supplies, processed goods like comp board or items we've come across during Xenothreat like Zeta Prolonide. Quantum fuel, scrap, and vice. You know, Jump Town doesn't just magic those boxes into existence. Interestingly, it's in the vice category that we have some of the best explanations of how the manufacturing line is drawn between the natural ingredients and the man-made commodities in recipes thanks to their descriptions. Just looking at Altrusia toxin, for example, is created by chemically processing the pollen of the revenant tree. So I hope this detour into crafting and commodities came across as intended, as a way to frame a thought piece in future discussions about the professions of Star Citizen, in the context of a wider recipe-driven crafting system, and wasn't too much of a tangent. In the next part of the video I'm going to go through all the different professions I could think of, and talk a little bit about each of them. I'll include timestamps in the video so you can use the chapter markers to skip ahead to any that you find more interesting, just if you've not got the time for the full thing. But I think the really interesting part of all this is how much synergy there is between different professions, and how, if this all comes together, we could end up with a truly multiplayer universe. I know that some people want a solo life, and I completely respect that. You do you, as I always say. But if CIG get this right, you could indeed play solo, but still be influenced and impacted by the actions of other players in the world around you. And at the higher end of player interactions, one of the things I'm massively excited to see is how player organisations work together and in opposition to one another. I'm going to break things down into six broad categories of knowledge, industrial, combat, support, logistics, and criminal. And I've got one bonus at the end for you that I couldn't fit into any of those six categories. But then we'll go down further into subcategories of individual broad professions. But as we'll see, the lines are going to get pretty blurry, any way that I try to cut this. In reality, there are likely to be multiple, more niche roles within a profession, and you as a player might bring in skills from various different professions to your own playstyle. This is the beauty of an MMO without a class system. Nobody's saying that just because you're looking to specialise in healing people, you can't have great FPS skills as well. But the reason people will probably gravitate towards a profession, or a short list of them, is that with the skill-based nature of Starset, it's going to be hard to be really, really good at lots and lots of things. Just before we dive into the meat and potatoes, if this vid does capture your attention and get you excited about Starset, and you want to head off and create yourself an account and grab a game pack, just make sure that when you do, you use a referral code to net yourself some extra credits. Mine's the one that's up on screen now, but if you've got a mate who plays, just use theirs. It took me a while to work out the best place to start this vid, but then I thought, how about the beginning? Exploration is the logical start of most gameplay loops, and in many ways every player in Star Citizen will be a part explorer, or at least leaning on exploration techniques. Miners need to find ore deposits, base builders need to locate a good spot, combat pilots need to work out where the people they're meant to be shooting are. But certainly some players will dedicate themselves to this profession, and consider themselves an explorer above all else. Thankfully there's no shortage of ships to cater to your needs, from small pathfinders like the Origin 315P or the Anvil Terrapin, to the large multi-crew ships such as the Anvil Carrick or the Misk Odyssey, designed to take you to the farthest reaches of the verse. For some, exploration will be an economic endeavour, either selling the secrets of deep space to others who can exploit the resources they've found, or passing the information along to orgmates who will take over once the goodies have been located. But of course, some will just climb a mountain because it's there. For many players, exploration is about experiencing adventures like those we've watched on TV and in movies. I do want to caveat some of this though, because I don't want this video to devolve too rapidly into figurative stargazing. The true potential of exploration in SC is still some way off. I don't mind sharing a bit of the hype I have for the game, I unapologetically really enjoy playing. But I also don't want to disappoint people who may be looking from the outside in. Right now, as CIG focus on developing gameplay systems and core tech, we just have the one single solar system, Stanton, which while it's incredibly large in PC game terms, doesn't exactly live up to the potential. The release of Pyro, a far less documented system than Stanton, which it's been indicated could make it for the end of this year, I'd take that with an RSI Bengal sized grain of salt, should really liven up exploration gameplay when it comes. You've got a much larger, more dangerous frontier to explore. However, in my opinion, this isn't game over for would-be explorers now. I think exploration is going to be one of the hardest professions to master, because you're going to have to have a wealth of game knowledge behind you. 
you're going to be far away from any potential help. So a small bit of damage to your ship or yourself that would be no big deal in Stanton could be a massive challenge. You're going to have to know how to deal with hostiles in either ship or FPS combat. And you'll need to have an industrialist's hat on when you try to work out if what you've found is worth enough to rush home with your information. Science gameplay has been on the tracker for a while, but we've had very little concrete information about how the mechanics will actually work. One bit that I was able to dig out from Star Citizen Live back in October 2019 included an interesting discussion about harvestables. The panellists were talking about how certain harvestable items could be analysed to obtain research data, from which scientists could determine potential stat buffs that players could use it to achieve, or extract chemical substances and take them to make anything from a virus to a weapon or a cure. The point is definitely to go in a more crafting-oriented, science-oriented domain. This leads me to think that science gameplay could be an integral part of how we as players learn new recipes for crafting, or acquire rare ingredients that might be required for certain recipes. Another element which I feel sits best under science is the concept of overclocking components and weapons. The MISC Endeavour, a modular ship with a tilt towards science and exploration gameplay, includes plans for a collider layout that would allow it to enhance components, creating unique parts that could give players an advantage in their chosen role. I can certainly see some mad scientists demanding top coin for their buffed shields or laser repeaters. I didn't know whether to leave data broking or info running to the hauling and trading section, since in many ways the nature of the professions may be quite similar. Trade in data versus trade in commodities has a lot of crossovers, but I felt this deserved its own section, since I feel some players will really be able to take this profession, and no pun intended, run with it. Certain ships like the Drake Herald and Crusader MSR are focused on this aspect of the game, with specially designed servers for storing large amounts of data. I do love how these two ships feel, both clearly built for speed as opposed to a stand-up fight. I think it's fairly logical to assume that would-be info runners are going to have to consider others wishing to steal this information that they have. In a world which clearly has long-range communication systems as we see in our Moby glasses, the main reason for physically carrying information would be its sensitivity. I can imagine that there will be some form of database gameplay that revolves around NPC controlled organisations, but I think dedicated data brokers will need to build their reputation with other players, establishing themselves as trusted conduits of information who haven't double dipped and sold their secrets to multiple parties. It might be possible to do this once, but afterwards fewer and fewer people are going to be willing to trust you. So now we're into the industrial gameplay, the professions which really have an economic focus. And those who've been around for a while now know that I really got my start making SE content with a focus on mining. It's one of those things that I never knew I'd enjoy as much as I did until I tried it. Mining in Star Citizen takes many forms, from hand mining to the use of ground vehicles, ships, and all the way up to the space-bound asteroid munching Orion. We can also see from a number of the facilities dotted around Stanton that there's clearly an outpost-based form of mining, which when we consider the plans for player-owned bases and land in the future, could lead to incredibly large-scale operations. The mining profession, like many others in SE, is going to have many different sub-roles within it, since finding, breaking and harvesting materials is a multi-stage process. At the smaller end, you may work as a solo prospector, controlling all parts of that process yourself. But at the larger end, you might specialise in one particular aspect of it as part of a crew or a multi-ship operation. It's also likely as we see more ships come online that the mining profession will expand to include gases as well as the raw metals and minerals that go into crafting recipes. I considered hiving gas extraction off into a separate profession, but I think it's likely to fall under the broader scope of mining quite neatly. The key to advancing as a miner isn't only going to be about knowing how to perfectly charge and crack rocks. It's also going to be about understanding the demand of potential customers, and assessing the value of a potential haul. Currently mining is one of the most developed gameplay loops from a technical standpoint, but it's a bit of a letdown on this front for the time being, and clearly it needs further development of the economy system to dynamically change the demand for the various commodities that it's possible to mine, so that savvy miners can get a feel for whether they've figuratively struck gold with their latest find. Patch 3.18 brings with it the first iteration of salvaging, hull stripping, and it provides a really good indication of what's to come with this profession. But the ultimate goal of salvage is a lot more than what's going to be on offer when this patch goes live. 
All stripping describes the method of scraping the outermost layer of valuable materials off derelict ships. But further down the line we can expect to use ships like the Aegis Reclaimer to their full potential, slicing apart the remains of the hull and compacting down the metals and alloys contained within for recycling. Before you even start stripping and munching though, it's probably worth going over to investigate the wreck to see if there are any components you might be able to recover. Maybe they're still functional or with a bit of tender loving care could be fixed up a bit and sold as seen. There could even be some cargo hanging around in the hold worth moving across to your own ship. Of course would-be salvages will need to be on edge since shadowy derelicts could easily represent a trap as much as a prize. Salvage is also another one of those really good professions to really talk about how different professions can integrate and synergize with one another. You might make friends with somebody who really loves doing combat because they're going to readily provide you with ships to salvage. Or even you might get information from a friendly org about a battle that they had where they left a lot of wrecks. And similarly you might want to work with people who are interested in things like repair as you might be able to provide them with materials that they can then use to sell onto their clients. In a way, those that get involved in the refining profession are going to be the first stage crafters, turning basic material commodities such as metal ores, scrap metals and gases into more useful products like refined ingots and fuels. These basic recipes are then likely to form the base of the majority of crafting chains, and as such will be incredibly important. Refining is undoubtedly something that a lot of mining and salvage orgs are going to want to keep in-house, and indeed in a case like the Orion, the refining is kept in ship with onboard refining facilities. However, even within a mining op, refining is likely to be a more dedicated profession, with a separate mechanic that players can specialise in mastering. And with specific refinery ships, like the Misk Expanse on the horizon, some players and orgs will certainly look to dedicate themselves to the profession exclusively buying ores and scrap off miners and salvagers at discount that they then turn into more valuable commodities to sell on. And this is the type of symbiotic relationship that really got the cogs turning and made me make this video, seeing how players can work together to maximise the amount of time they spend on the gameplay that they really love. The Expanse Q&A has a few interesting bits of info about how CIG view the refining profession working. And refining appears to have three levels ranging in terms of how passive or active a player wants to be. Completely passive refining is what we see at the refinery stations in-game now, where a player delivers ore, selects a procedure, and then goes back out to mine or heads off to bed. Ship-based refining is going to be more active, with an option at the opposite end of the spectrum to effectively design your own refining recipe, where you could land somewhere in the middle by selecting a well-known method. I wonder if this could even filter into the knowledge-based professions, and maybe one player could develop and trade the secrets of their handcrafted refining process to another for a price. Of course, another way to get primary ingredients for crafting is to grow them yourself. And we have very limited information to work with when it comes to agricultural pursuits, but we do know that through the Endeavours Biodome modules and hydroponics buildings shown in player outpost design briefs, it's a loop envisaged by CIG. While a lot of agricultural commodities will undoubtedly be focused on keeping people fed, the profession should also lend itself to producing recipe ingredients for things like medical supplies and, you know, other slightly less legal stuff. There's also the potential that the players will be able to claim high-end agricultural land on certain moons or planets with climates that support mass industrial-scale farming. There's an awesome series on the Star Citizen YouTube channel called Lawmaker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the law team go through the background for a bunch of systems. In the episode on Bremen, Will Weisbaum talks about the massive terror mills farming fields created in order to feed the UE military during the Tavarin War. And in 10 for the Chairman, episode 78, Chris talks about how varying the distance to the local system star or controlling the gravity your crops are under should be able to affect the quality of your crops. So in many ways, space farmers may either be searching for the optimum plot of land to base themselves on, or taking to the stars to position a ship like the Endeavour in the perfect place for a bumper yield. Farmers are going to have to carefully consider where they put their roots down though, not only in terms of ensuring the best results for their crops, but also in terms of avoiding unwanted attention, since your bumper harvest might be a tempting target for pirates. But speaking of land claims which I've touched on a few times now, let's also talk about construction. So if you get through this video and want to know more about CIG's plans for base building, assuming you haven't grown sick of my voice by then, I do have a much fuller deep dive into this aspect which I'll link in the vid description. 
but in a slightly more condensed fashion. Uh, the devs plan to allow players to build their own bases and settlements on moons and planets across the verse. You'll be able to either build out in the wild, hoping that nobody comes along and finds you with bad intent, or take the additional precaution of claiming land in UEE space using a land claim license. These beacons allow you to register a 4km2 or 8km2 parcel of land, meaning that even if some bad guys come along and try to interfere with your outpost, you'll always remain the owner of that territory. While I'm very excited to see what happens with land claiming and base building, having spent a ton of time building bases in games like Ark, I would caution that the mechanic is unlikely to appear anytime soon. So while it's okay to look forward to this aspect of the game, just don't go holding your breath. If you do want to gain a bit of insight into how construction mechanics might look in the future, I'd encourage you to go and watch the final third of the CitizenCon 2951 Crafting Worlds video, in which Morgan and Mark talk about the Rastar tool. I missed Morgan's final comment in my base building video that the tool will become available to you the player and Rastar is what will make you a pioneer. He was kind enough to reach out to me in the comments and highlight how the plan is to put this tool, which is currently used by devs to help in building NPC controlled outposts, into our hands with the construction oriented ships. Based on what we see of ground based facilities and outposts in the game currently and comments from devs in videos such as the ATV anniversary special from November 2017 and the 2947 citizen comp panels, it would appear that bases will be required to take advantage of resources at scale, with details of buildings specialising in agriculture, mining, refining, as well as those with a more defensive or scientific purpose. So construction threads into many other professions. And when the mechanic does release, I feel that some players could dedicate themselves almost exclusively to the construction profession, specialising in building bases either for their org or as contractors working for others. Specialist equipment like the Consolidated Outland Pioneer could give you a decided advantage. And for players and orgs who maybe just want one small homestead or outpost, Investing in one may be pointless if they could instead pay a fee to a player or construction oriented organisation who live and breathe building. When you get into the weeds in videos like this, there are plentiful other niche opportunities that emerge, and I wonder if in the future we'll see some players emerge as real estate moguls, investing in quality land, building high-end infrastructure on it, and then renting the plot out to others who may actually want to run it. For many, based on the comments on my base building deep dive, the true dream, though, is simply a small farmstead with a beautiful view out on a wild frontier moon. Finally, for the industrial section, I've decided to include manufacturing or crafting as a professional to itself. Information is a bit light on the ground, so I don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole, and I do want to put a big healthy speculation warning on whatever I'm saying. But with that caveat, I think it's safe to assume that, with even a rudimentary crafting system in place, we would see players who dedicate themselves to the profession of making cool stuff for others. In many other MMOs, crafters are an entirely separate class, some of whom set up shop in a highly populated area and rely entirely on others to bring them the materials they might need to make quality items that they can sell on for a tidy profit. It remains to be seen how deep CIG Aga let us go into the crafting system, and on what scale we as players will be able to get involved. Will crafting mostly be focused on subsistence, or creating particularly high quality items, or will we be able to take it to a full industrial economic level with player owned manufacturing facilities and ships? Time will tell with this one, but regardless of how deep the crafting mechanics are taken, I'm sure some players will push the profession as far as they can, either becoming the ultimate scrap heap challenger, cobbling useful bits and pieces together for their org while they're out in the field, or running a massive enterprise printing credits. So next on from industrial, we'll look at the logistics focused professions. And logistics to me is anything which is the glue that binds everything together. And we'll start with hauling and trade, which I've included together because I feel they contain a lot of the same features, but we do need to disambiguate the terms. For me, hauling is the act of getting goods from A to B, while trading is looking to buy goods for cheap with your own wallet and sell them high to bolster your own bank account. The difference then is the risk you're willing to take. If you're hauling goods for someone else, then the only risk you take is your reputation. Whereas if you're trading, you're also taking financial risk. Hauling is likely to be split by weight class, most logically with massive haulers like the whole D and E from Misk making their epic galaxy crossing voyages between systems and dropping their cargo off on massive logistical hubs 
where smaller ships can make the shorter, more efficient journeys. That said, there could be an angle for a particularly savvy hauler to specialise in carrying high-value goods in their small ship. CIG haven't talked for a while about the jump gates that will enable transit between systems, but historically they described them as being of different sizes, and it could be that a smart hauler could make a journey between two systems much quicker using a small ship than a large or capital class hauler would be able to achieve, and this could be essential in delivering goods in a time-sensitive manner. I think in the majority of cases a trader will also be hauling their own goods, there might well be cases in the future where incredibly wealthy citizens outsource the actual movement of goods to others while they sit in their richly appointed offices at Area 18 and sniff out the trends in the intergalactic markets. Whether it's your wallet or somewhere else is on the line though, hauling and trading is the lifeblood of an economy like the one Star Citizen is going for. I find this comment from Chris Roberts back in 2015 particularly poignant and he really highlights how there won't be a global auction house like we find in other MMOs. In finance we have this idea called the efficient market hypothesis. The very short, very brushed over version of it is that share and commodity prices should reflect all information and therefore there's no point trying to beat the market. But in reality a lot of markets are inefficient. Sometimes you can spot things that other people haven't because you woke up before they did, or you read an article that gave you a different insight into demand for certain goods or, you know, insider trading. It would seem that from what Chris has said, that markets in Star Citizen are going to be incredibly inefficient on a verse-wide basis. So while the price you can buy goods for in one system might be fair, there might be a huge opportunity if you take them to a different system to sell. We saw a little bit of this with the Ninetales event, where because of an engineered supply-demand shock in the form of a Ninetales attack, demand for medical supplies went through the roof at a certain station. I can imagine this being replicated on a much bigger scale, with traders mining whatever data sources they can to see how they can take advantage. I just really hope that CIG look to incorporate in-game sources like newswires, as opposed to the mining in question being data mining. But I won't hold my breath on that one, you know, we gamers are gamers. In a similar way to how goods need to make their way physically around the verse, so too will personnel and vehicles. I've quoted him a few times, but a mate of mine, Rolanders, likes to say that passengers are just cargo that load themselves. Passenger transports range in size and scope, from small luxurious craft such as the Spirit V1 from Crusader, to the bulk passenger ships like the Genesis Starliner. And these two factors, size and luxury, are likely to affect the types of transport missions you can engage in. Just drawing some read across from Elite Dangerous, where potential passengers would specify the rating of accommodation they would accept, you could fit more passengers into an economy cabin, but first class passengers pay a lot more for their ticket. As well as passengers, vehicles will need to make their way across large distances. A lot of players own and prefer to use ships that won't be capable of traversing some of the distances involved in Starset. So certainly there'll be scope for those who enjoy this type of gameplay to offer the services of something like an Anvil Liberator to ferry a small group of players with their fighters, or maybe a Hercules C2 to get a racing org ship to the next Murray Cup circuit. There's every chance the players who don't even own a transport specific ship or want to focus on transport as a core profession could use this as a way to earn a few more credits. I'm reminded of Firefly where Mal and friends purely take on a few passengers as they stop off just to help pay the fuel and repair bills to stop their ship falling out of the sky. All of this allows for some great interaction between players, and I think if your org is on top of this, it could really help smooth things out and make sure that everyone can maximise their game time. Maybe you don't have much time to get on, but you know that your org are moving off to a new location tomorrow. So maybe you could log out on board a Starliner, and when you log in after work the next day, wake up ready to roll out with your org mates since some of them transported you across the verse. This does assume that you trust your org mates not to kidnap you and dump you on some nameless rock of course. So now we're on to the combat roles, and I think one of the biggest issues with breaking down combat professions is that combat itself becomes a very broad church. Overall the role of a combat focused player on the lawful side the real meaning behind why they're doing what they're doing is quite narrow. The main driving factor is that there's someone else, a player or an NPC, who needs to be dealt with. The biggest economic reason for this is going to be security. In a PvP environment that's also, even in the medium security stanton end of things, teaming with NPC bad guys, 
Those who have an industrial motivation are likely to contract combat players to either look after them and watch their backs, or go in in advance of an industrial operation and deal with the bad guys ahead of time. However, while that objective is quite simple, the way in which you actually go about accomplishing it and the range of challenges you might face is incredibly varied, and within the overall security or mercenary umbrella, there are likely to be many different sub-roles. The skills required to succeed as an ace fighter pilot, for example, will be completely different to those needed to command a capital class vessel such as an Idris. And if we scale things higher to the concept of fleet battles, you'd even have a completely separate role of fleet commander, someone who's looking at things at a macro level rather than focusing on the command of a single ship. There's already no shortage of combat oriented missions in Star Citizen, from getting up close and personal in FPS bunker or cave missions, the massive fleet battles we had during the Xeno threat event. However, I think as the game grows, the most interesting combat content is going to be found by engaging with other groups of players, maybe offering protection to a group of miners out in the fringes, or clearing a pirate syndicate out from a moon ahead of some colonists looking to build a base. Potentially, SC may even incorporate a degree of sovereignty like we see in EVE Online, allowing player orgs to control certain locations at which point it's highly likely that full-fledged wars would break out between large groups in an effort to exercise control. In all these circumstances, experienced combat players are going to be incredibly valuable. You might find some orgs like the one I lead, Frontier, which aim to house combat and non-combat divisions under one roof. But you'll find others who look to act as mercenaries, focusing entirely on combat, from niche FBS squads all the way up to full combined armed forces. This is what makes player orgs great. The sheer variety means everyone should be able to find something that appeals to them. I've included bounty hunting as its own specific subcategory, given the objective is likely to evolve a little in terms of capturing rather than killing a target. Right now in 3.18 there's no capture element, with the term apprehend suspect being wholly interchangeable with below suspect to smithereens. But there are a number of ship features and mechanics discussions that show CIG is heading that way over time. CIG have mentioned a few times about looking to move to tier 2 of the profession, making bounty hunters work harder to track their targets, following a trail of breadcrumbs as opposed to having a big go here kill this label over their heads. Once located, there are also plans for non-lethal weapons to help you fulfil the alive part of dead or alive, potentially maximising your profit in the process, and specific bounty hunter ships such as the Anvil Hawk, Aegis Avenger Stalker and Drake Cutlass Blue all have prisoner pods allowing for the safe transport of captured bounties. I'd really like to see a large or capital prison barge type ship, allowing bounty hunting orcs to have a mothership to drop prisoners off at before heading back out for more, and potentially some particularly enterprising members of the profession could buy bounties for a discount off those with smaller ships and then make a tidy profit taking them to the system offering the highest reward for their capture. I just can't wait to see the first prison barge breakout video someone out there on the less law-abiding side of things makes though. Support careers are mostly about getting people up when they're down, and nowhere is that more clear than in the medical profession. Early iterations of medical gameplay are live now with players mostly entering an in-cap state when taken to zero HP rather than just dying instantly. A combination of drugs can be administered to get them back on their feet. If they've suffered an injury as a result of their damage, mask the negative effects long enough to get them to a medical facility. Within the overarching category of the medical profession, there's quite a wide array of roles, so some players may wish to play the part of emergency responders, getting quickly into downed individuals on the front line of a war zone or after an accident, while others may prefer to treat patients as they're brought in. Where they appear in game, medical beds have screens that can be accessed by a third party, so I'd imagine as medical gameplay develops that we'll continue to see more active loops concerning treatment provision. Medics could exist within an organisation, always on hand to provide a safety net during missions, or an entire org could be formed around the idea of providing rapid response and medical facilities, wherever they're needed across the verse. The loop is only going to get more and more important as consequences for death start to build. Already with the changes to inventory made in 316, you'll frequently see medical beacons pop up on servers that you can respond to, since players don't want to lose the loot they've just gathered. But one of Chris Roberts' favourite concepts is death of a spaceman, so while we'll be able to regenerate and clone bodies a number of times, over time our imprints will decay and ultimately your character could die leaving you to leave your assets to an heir with whom to continue your adventures. 
but only time will tell how punishing losing your character could be. The only near certainty is that you'll probably want to avoid it, so good medics could well be worth their weight in gold. In much the same way as damage to your body can leave you stranded, so can damage to your ship or a lack of fuel. I'm sure any players of Elite Dangerous will know the fuel rats who focus entirely on rescuing folks, like me, who are incapable of plotting a sensible jump route. And I'm sure we'll see similarly minded players in SC as time goes on. And maybe some will help their fellow citizens just out of good karma, but others will surely make a business out of it, charging some credits as a recovery free, or maybe a box or two of your cargo if you can't pay. I personally can't wait to hear some of the stories of breakdown negotiations in the deep black. You know, will you be able to trust someone to come onto your ship knowing that you're far away from a comma ray and effectively defenseless? Players who develop a good reputation for their repair, refuel and rearm abilities will certainly not be short of work though. As we move into more remote, larger systems, it will be essential for orgs conducting any form of mission or operation to consider their support requirements. Right now a friendly station or outpost where you can restock and repair is never more than a few million kilometres away. But once we get into Pyro you can very easily find yourself stranded if you don't have the right ships and people with you. If you're interested in this type of gameplay you might want to check out ships like the Misk Starfarer. It's a hulking refueling vessel that you can actually use right now to carry out this function. And even if there's no great need for in the field refueling, it wouldn't hurt to start getting your practice in. In 318 you could always hand salvage some wrecks and use the repair functionality of the multi-tool to patch yourself and others up as well. A bit further out you could look forward to ships like the Aegis Vulcan and Anvil Crucible which offer full repairing, rearming and refueling support. Deep space in Star Citizen is meant to be a dangerous place, and COG have gone to great lengths to incorporate this into their design, with outlaw locations such as Grim Hex and Levski offering sanctuary to less savoury characters, and plenty of criminal factions such as the Ninetales and the Dusters providing the good guys with plenty of folks to shoot at. But if you're looking to take a walk on the dark side as a player, there are a number of options for you. The first and foremost is to don your eye patch, take a swig of rum, and embark on a life of space piracy. The Pirates vs Griefers debate in SE is well worn, but piracy is very much a factor that's here to stay in the game, and for me personally I wouldn't have it any other way. To me one of the things that keeps games like Star Set exciting is the danger that someone else might be looking to come and take what I have. And with the cargo refactor changes in 318 allowing players to take cargo crates off another player's ship and sell them onto a fence via one of the no questions asked terminals dotted around Stanton, this patch could well be the one that piracy really comes alive. While I expect we'll see an influx of would-be pirates in the coming months, I'd imagine a number of them will get a rude awakening, as what they thought would be an easy life of crime turns out to be a lot more difficult than they imagined. Pirates need to have fairly expansive knowledge in order to successfully make off with a prize. Not only do you need to defeat your opponents and any security they have in ship combat, you need to do it without completely destroying the prize in the process and you also have to be able to board them and take control of the ship in FPS. Add to that the logistical skill to unload the valuable cargo from the vessel with a timer running against you in case the crew you just jacked come back with their friends. And of course, none of that matters if you don't find someone to pirate to begin with. You will need to have a working knowledge of mining locations and trade routes in order to track down potential targets in the depths of space ideally taking them out of quantum travel and keeping them from making a break for it with a ship like the RSI Mantis. All in all, being a pirate is a challenging game loop that's likely to put your skills and patience to the test. In the far future of the game, I can see pirate syndicates reaching agreements with strong military industrial orgs, who may wish to direct them as privateers, using them to harass the industry and supply lines of rival orgs, all with plausible deniability. I'm using the term wet work to cover espionage, theft and assassination, but also make it clear that I'm talking about espionage in terms of an in-game activity as opposed to the discord infiltration tactics of some level 50 neckbeards. Don't worry, I get that it will be part of the game, I just think it's lame. Instead I'm talking about the kinds of missions we get offered by Vaughan in the personal tab of the contract manager. And currently these are mostly focused on assassinating UEE targets, essentially providing a reverse bounty hunting experience. But as well as assassination, we also see espionage and theft featuring an ISC presentation on professions. 
When talking about the corporate culture of microtech in Star Citizen Live back in April 2020, Dave Haddock commented that obviously there's a huge market for corporate espionage, so that would be sort of a big thing we get to play with. The stakes are so high, but there's a lot of cutting edge development going on. People are willing to shed some blood to get the next hot app. In a Sitcon 2949 demo, the devs demonstrated a prototype mission where the player used stealth to sneak into a facility on Microtech, disguising themselves as an employee and sneaking around in the air ducts to hack some data and make their escape. I think this type of wet work could open up a whole realm of gameplay opportunities for a player willing to master it, particularly if the goal is to actually get away with your crimes undetected. Right now you can try out those Vaughn missions, and while they can be a funny way to get yourself a 5 star wanted rating and enjoy a bit of PvP when players come after your bounty, it can be even more enjoyable if you plan your moves. Hack the Comoray to give yourself a window to take out your target without any repercussions. And hopefully this style of almost heist-like gameplay develops further as the game evolves. And finally under the criminal professions, I'm going to talk about smuggling and fencing. And obviously these professions could live under the auspices of hauling and trading, but smuggling and fencing deserve to stand on their own as the shady cousins of the more legitimate professions. In reality, I think it's likely that a lot of players who partake in the gameplay of moving contraband or buying stolen goods for onward sale will exist in the grey. They'll probably mix this with moving goods legally and occasionally dip a toe into the darker end of things. But it should generate some really interesting gameplay opportunities. Learning obscure routes to avoid meeting with the authorities where possible and masking cargo to ensure that it doesn't show up on scanners when you do get stopped. A number of ships like the Crusader Mercury Star Runner and RSI Constellation Taurus have special shielded areas decided to turn away prying eyes. This could be useful if you're moving some particularly valuable cargo that you don't want would-be pirates to see, but it could be just the ticket for moving a few cases of slam alongside your shipment of processed food. Smuggling is an area I would personally love to see CIG do some more work on. Currently you can engage in the trade of contraband by purchasing vice commodities such as drugs from off-grid labs like Jumptown or Paradise Cove, and moving it to shadier locations like Grimhex, or some of the salvage yards to sell. But to me the loop could get a lot more exciting, if I was picking up a small package from, say, Grimhex and then trying to move it into a high security area like Lawville. A little while ago we did a trek from HDMS Edmund to Lawville, which is about 60 kilometers or so. We did it over land in Grey Cat Steve's, and I couldn't help but think how cool it would be if we each had a couple of boxes of maize in the trunk, that if delivered to a criminal NPC in Lawville itself could fetch a huge profit. For big time fences, the ultimate dream will probably be that of a Drake Kraken privateer, a deep space shopping mall which you can open up to customers who don't ask too many questions, out of reach of any planet planetary security or the UEE. Obviously running such an enterprise would come with risks. You can't exactly crime stat someone who crashes your illegal space bazaar that you parked outside of the comma ray. But this is where I think certain players are going to use a mix of hard and soft power. Only a fool would open their doors without any form of security, providing a heavy handed solution, but also the reputation of the fence will play a big part in keeping customers honest. If you have a good rep for moving ill gotten goods, then pirates may not wish to take advantage of you for fear of hurting their own reputations and limiting the options they have to move their merchandise. Okay, so there was one more profession that I really wanted to cover, but I couldn't fit it neatly into any one of my boxes. But racing is definitely worth a bonus segment. While it's awesome to see the attention the racing scene is getting from the devs, it's also one of the best examples of something the community has really driven forward, with player created tracks and events that have now been canonised in game, and orgs such as XGR dedicated to this aspect. Whether you want to race in the air or on the ground, you'll find a host of dedicated vehicles such as the Misk Razor, Origin M50 and Tumble Cyclone RC. But don't worry, you can also rely on the community to race things that were never meant to be raced. One of my personal favourites is definitely the Argo Cargo Circuit Horizon. With 318 we're going to see a lot more development of racing as an actual gameplay loop though, with CIG introducing racing missions via the contract manager, challenging players to go and clock a decent time around one of Stanton's many new tracks. I'd love to be able to include a bit more footage of this, but to be honest racing for me is about going out with my org mates and making an event of it so I've mostly been avoiding the racetracks in the PTU so I can experience them with our race team at Frontier. 
I may have had a couple of goes around the PTV go-karting track at Origin though, since I'm determined to be at least mildly competitive when the patch goes live. So you may be glad to know that we've reached the end of what's been a rather lengthy video. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch it. I hope you got something out of it and please do let me know down in the comments what you're looking forward to the most and what you see yourself doing in the game. Or indeed, let me know if I've made any glaring oversights or omissions of a profession you've got your eye on. If I can get enough of them, there might even be a part two. I did consider splitting this video up into a number of episodes to condense it, but one of the coolest things to my mind is how much the professions of Star Citizen intertwine with one another. Combat aces won't get very far without logisticians to get them to a combat zone, who in turn may rely on explorers to have plotted a course for them. And they'll need support players to patch them up, who may rely on materials supplied by the industrial salvagers who circle battlefields like Carrion. And why are they all there in the first place if not to deal with some naughty criminals who've been causing trouble? And another of the best things about Starset to my mind is that you don't have to be just one of these things. Some players may specialise completely and dedicate every second of their game time to mastering a certain loop, while others might become generalists with many different strings to their bow. The only thing that's going to hold you back is your skill and practice at a certain aspect of the game, not a class system like you might find in other MMOs. I think I'll leave it there before I ramble on for too long. And if you enjoyed the vid and think I earned it, then please leave a like and hit subscribe if you haven't already. If you reckon it would be of use to them, consider sharing it with a friend, an org mate, your grandma. And if you'd like to hop into our Discord and have a chat and meet some new folks, then please come on over via the link in the vid description. With all that said, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end, and I look forward to seeing you next time.